Hello and welcome to another edition of Cardiac Imaging Agora. In this session, we will uh, go again over a step-by-step -step reading of a cardiac PET to define SCAR, identify SCAR, or hibernating myocardium. Start with some basic foundation for this. So I always think about myocardium as in the context of myocardium at risk. So this concept of myocardium at risk will state that normal perfusion at rest indicates viable myocardium. That kind of uh, situation does not really require FDG to identify myocardium at risk. It might, it might indicate that we need to do a stress part of it to see if there is ischemia, but if you have normal perfusion at rest, that is by definition a viable myocardium that's being perfused. The next two concepts, stress-induced ischemia is viable myocardium. So that would not require uh, FDG either to identify uh, viability because by definition there's ischemia and therefore the myocardium was viable at rest. And the next concept is that FDG uptake in an area of perfusion defect indicates viable and thus hibernating myocardium. So these last two statements are important to keep in mind to construct what we call myocardium, myocardium at risk. So instead of reporting things as 10% ischemia, 10% uh, scar, 20% hibernation, you have to give a report at the end of the day that will, will define the totality of the myocardium at risk rather than these individual fragmented uh, uh, statements. Again, we go with our uh, beautiful laundry list of uh, uh, steps, uh, how we read this test. We start with the transmission images and we go down step by step uh, to end up uh, generating a clinically meaningful report. So this is a patient, a 63 year old uh, uh, male, which we will talk about later, but usually I like to read these images independent of the clinical history uh, it's often you're not blinded to uh, gender and, uh, and age. Uh, and uh, this patient was referred for a rest, stress, and FDG uh, PET, pharmacological PET. At our institution, we use uh, regadenosin. We've been uh, using it for years. We're very happy with it. So these are the rest images. Again, the importance of uh, the uh, transmission and the emission images to make sure we have proper alignment of the myocardium at rest and stress. Uh, for the emission and transmission images. Sometimes it's very difficult, especially if you have a defect like you see right here to figure out where the myocardium ends and how to superimpose it on the uh, CT images. But you try to align the other segments and often it works very well. I use usually the RV as a place where I also uh, uh, try to align the myocardium and that aligns everything else uh, 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 as, a, as part of that. So these are the rest uh, transmission image, emission images. These are the stress images, uh, emission and transmission images. Same exercise here, making sure everything is aligned so we don't have misregistration. Again, it's very hard not to see this large perfusion defect right here. You can see it actually as well down here in these uh, beautiful uh, uh, reconstructed images. And then you look finally at the FDG images because you have three sets of images, stress images, stress images, and FDG images. Each of these images will have emission and transmission images and therefore you have to make sure all of them are aligned. And here we are, uh, we end up with the FDG images. Then we go to the, uh, the construction planes. You can see on the stress on top, rest in the middle, uh, the uh, software picked up the, the ventricle quite well uh, where the boundaries are all well constructed. In the FDG, as is often is the case, uh, you can see the software went over somewhere in the uh, GI. The heart is actually right up here. So we have to realign this. So we try to drag it up and now you can see the heart uh, rest, uh, sorry, stress, uh, rest in the middle and FDG in the bottom right, uh, right here. Then we go to the reconstructed images uh, uh, very clearly here, rest here, stress here in the short axis. You have a very uh, severe uh, fixed uh, perfusion defect in the anterolateral wall. Uh, you can see it clearly again, moving all the way from the uh, apex all the way to the base of the heart, sparing the very uh, base uh, right here where everything almost normalizes. And you can see it again here in the vertical long axis images that uh, overall the fixed perfusion defect uh, sparing the, uh, uh, the apex. We will talk about that in a, in a bit. Now we go to uh, score this, uh, this defect. Again, here I tried to this time to superimpose the raw counts for the uh, 
uh, areas from PET, which you get from PET. This is sometimes helpful if you have an issue of uh, uh, scaling artifacts or things like that. But here you can see the counts, the row counts that the camera is seeing in all these segments. And again, a very uh, nice uh, fixed perfusion defect anterolaterally, uh, sparing the basal interior wall and the stress images. And the apex anus has a very mild defect right here. You can see it, but overall it's fine. The septum is fine. Uh, despite the fact that the software is reading this as a, as a reversible defect, Actually, uh, you can look at here, there's not much uh, of uh, reversibility in the, uh, in the inferior wall visually. Uh, at least uh, it's not that bad. And by counts, it's, uh, they looked, they're in the same uh, range of counts. If, not, if anything, actually the inferior wall has higher counts here. Uh, so sometimes the software is a bit too sensitive and you have to adjust uh, for it. So we go next to the um, uh, FTG images. We can see that defect that we saw on the rest images right here, and we'll make sure if there's any uptake in the FTG. In the FTG images, again, there is no uh, uh, uptake. Uh, that defect here seems to be, uh, uh, again, present on the FTG metabolic images. Therefore, this is a definition of scarred myocardium where we have a matching defect between the rest images and the FTG images. Uh, we scored that uh, at our institution. We decided to follow the guidelines of the American Society of Cardiology, where a viable is one and two is scarred. And we go ahead and score these segments as scarred here. And this is the rest defect. So this is the perfusion here in this polar map. And this is the, uh, these are the FTG uh, scores, uh, all indicating scar in that territory that we had anterolaterally as uh, a perfusion defect matched by the FTG uh, images. Uh, we put everything together on this uh, nice uh, polar map. That's the one that our uh, uh, physicians see in the electronic medical record when they open the, uh, the uh, report. They can actually go and say, okay, this is what they're talking about, anterolateral, this is what we see. These are the defects, it's the extent of the defect, the severity of the defect. It just gives it a visual, uh, a visual uh, uh, impression that's easier to grasp than uh, text. Then we go to the histogram of the gated images, uh, rest here on the left-hand side and stress here. Again, this was acquired at a heart rate of 105 and then with post-stress a heart rate of 122. So that's actually reassuring, telling us that the patient vasodilated and responded to the regadenosine. This is expected with regadenosine to get anywhere between 15 and 20 uh, beats increase in heart rate with a drop in blood pressure. But we have no ectopy and no uh, misgating of the images. We go to the gated images. Uh, we can see that uh, wall motion of mat in the anterolateral wall right here. You can see it nicely here. And you can see from rest to stress, actually there is an increase in volume. So blue is rest and uh, orange is stress. And you can see there is, despite the same ejection fraction almost, there is an increase in volume from rest uh, to stress, slight increase in volume, indicating some uh, uh, ischemic dilatation of the left ventricle or in this case, since we did not see ischemia, just stress to stress dilatation of the left ventricle. That is again, something we see on uh, PET. We're, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful feature of PET because what we're doing on PET, again, is we're imaging at peak stress where the patient is still under the camera. So you can see these kind of findings. Again, think about other non-ischemic uh, reasons for that, like uh, mitral regurgitation, significant mitral regurgitation, aortic stenosis, uh, uh, things that, uh, that can lead to left ventricular dilatation. The next one is we look at the synchrony. This is uh, on the right-hand side. I always put an example of a normal uh, synchronous ventricle in a different subject, different patient. On this side here, on the left-hand side, you can see how the synchronous is this ventricle from uh, or both at rest and stress. The segments are not contracting in harmony and they're not reaching peak contractility. Uh, all. They re they're reaching it at the same time, but not to the same uh, extent. So this reflects uh, some left ventricular dyssynchrony. If you look at the standard deviation here, again, we defined eight as being normal. Anything above eight indicates the synchrony. This shows that the synchronous ventricle standard deviation is 12 and 13 post uh, stress. We do not calculate the blood flow on these uh, patients with ejection fraction that's low. So the value of that is not clear and the specificity is not, is not clear. So we avoid doing that. Sometimes we do it just for uh, research purposes, but not in this instance. Uh, so we do not fill this, uh, this field. Then we go back and look at the uh, CT images looking for calcium uh, calcifications. You can see some calcium in the aorta here, and you can see extensive calcification 
uh, in the uh, uh, coronary arteries uh, right here. 63 years old, uh, uh, again, uh, we'll talk about him in a minute uh, about the clinical presentation. Now uh, to the meaningful report, uh, we filled the indication for this. This is patient has known CAD coming with uh, dyspnea and shortness of breath and chest pain. Uh, this is the uh, radiation dose uh, he received, uh, 66 for the DLP. Uh, the dose given, what time it's given for rubidium rest, stress, and for the FDG, 8.9 millicuries for the FDG. Then we go for the clinical part of, this, of the report where we have the baseline uh, heart rate, blood pressures, uh, medications the patient is using, uh, prior history of interventions, uh, what happened during the stress test. Again, we can see this nice uh, uh, drop in blood pressure. Uh, and increase in heart rate from, uh, from rest to stress. And the patient had a chest pain uh, during the uh, stress test. Uh, we look at, we filled the, the field for left ventricle, moderately dilated, moderately reduced. Uh, here are the ejection fractions, 35 and 36%. The right ventricle was normal in size and function. We filled that part up. Then we go to the, uh, uh, to the part related to the uh, perfusion defects. Again, this is an abnormal study. We score these segments. This gets translated into filling these uh, fields with, uh, with these uh, scores for the rest uh, here in the middle, stress here, and the FDG here. And we fill here, there's no ischemia. There's scar, we call it in the LAD territory, and then we'll come talk about that in a second. And there is no hibernation. Uh, we finally have to generate the report. This is a high risk scan, mainly driven by the uh, low ejection fraction. Uh, the, also the dilatation of left ventricle. And uh, we saw coronary calcifications here. And this is the report generated basically telling us what we saw during uh, this test from the amount of scar uh, to the hibernating myocardium, the absence of hibernating or ischemic myocardium and the function of left and right ventricle. So this is a male, again, 63 year old, had a remote PCI in 2006, comes in, this is his resting EKG uh, showing uh, LVH by voltage with poor R wave progression in the anterolateral uh, or in the chest uh, leads uh, right here, all the way from V2 to V6. Uh, this patient actually uh, had chest pain, had an, EK, had an echocardiogram done. This is his echocardiogram. On presentation, you can see that uh, overall global left ventricular dysfunction, but predominantly in the lateral wall, you see it in the, in the next uh, images here. This is a modified uh, subcostal view. You can see these segments are contracting nice, but the lateral wall uh, is uh, akinetic and thinned out. You see it also here in the short axis images, uh, normal contractility of most of the segments, except uh, for the uh, inferolateral and anterolateral walls here in the uh, subcostal uh, uh, images. So uh, the patient went to the CAT lab and they found this lesion. However, the fellow uh, doing the CAT with one of our attendings uh, told him, do you want to look at the echo? What I see here is this uh, ramus, uh, severe ramus lesion, but on the echo, the lateral wall appears to be very thinned out. And I don't know if we should open this uh, or not. Uh, patient had no enzymes, uh, no features of an acute presentation. So uh, they stopped the train actually, and then they sent the patient to, uh, to the PET, which showed, as you saw, no viability in that segment. So in this uh, session, we, we learned about a couple of things. One is to avoid the oculus stenotic reflex. So by the fact that the person uh, who was reading this uh, looked at the echo, saw how thin is the lateral wall and akinetic it is, expected maybe that there wouldn't be any recovery of uh, function in that lateral wall if they revascularized this patient, uh, went onto the PET and saw that this is a scar territory, so no benefit from revascularization and exposing these, this patient to a future dual interpretive therapy without any, uh, besides the risk of the procedure uh, and the financial aspect of it without any uh, uh, benefit uh, that uh, can be predicted from, uh, from his uh, echo and the PET. Uh, so reviewing all the available data, the EKG, the echo, uh, severely fixed defects as we can see can represent hibernation or scar. In this instance, it was scar. It is unwise to open a coronary vessel to dead myocardium. Uh, you're not gonna probably get any benefit from that. And in this instance, because of the sparing of the apex, which I showed you earlier in multiple images, you can see that sparing of the apex very often indicates one or two things. First one, 
could be that the patient had a, a mammary graft to the LAD post bypass. In this instance, it was not, the patient never had that. Or it can indicate a diagonal or ramus lesion. We see that uh, not infrequently in patients who have had a stent in the LAD with jailing of the diagonal or an isolated diagonal or ramus lesion as it is in this case. So this is a case of, uh, again, a useful, uh, usefulness of PET in differentiating uh, scar from hibernating uh, myocardium, uh, targeting uh, ischemic area if uh, there are uh, areas at risk. Uh, understanding the concept of myocardium at risk as a totality of hibernation and ischemia and normal myocardium. And uh, finally, uh, putting all these images uh, together to guide therapy and prevent unnecessary uh, revascularization and exposure to uh, uh, harmful medications if they're not needed. With that, uh, I want to thank all of you who are watching this. Uh, this is uh, three weeks uh, in. Uh, we've had uh, over uh, uh, 1,300 uh, viewers, uh, 52 uh, hours, almost 53 hours of watch time. This is our website, 23 sessions in uh, three weeks uh, posted. We'll keep you all entertained and educated. This is a new era we live in. It is an opportunity to uh, democratize uh, uh, imaging uh, and make it, uh, take it out of the ivory tower of uh, uh, the way it's being presented, right? Or which used to be presented in the past where, and then make it available uh, for free and for fun uh, for, uh, for all of us. Thank you again, and uh, hopefully you join us uh, very soon.